So welcome everybody to our webinar, Introducing Climate Studies at Minority Serving Institutions, which is a collaborative effort of AMS and Second Nature. My name is Gabriela uh, Bosio, and I'm a Senior Program Associate with Second Nature. Um, I will be hosting our webinar today. I want to let you know a couple of features before we get started. Um, in your GoToWebinar panel, you will see an option for questions. Um, please be aware that you can use this to send us questions at any time that we will then try to address during the Q&A session. So today we are going to have um, James Bray, the Director of Education Programs at the American Meteorological Society. Then we will be hearing from Christina reeves Shaw, who is the Physics and Engineering Program Coordinator at Cedar Valley College. And then we will be hearing from Paul Bartlett, Research Fellow at St. Peter's University. First, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to uh, Second Nature and the ACUPCC. A lot of you know who we are. You are signatories of our program. Second Nature is a nonprofit based in Boston, and we're trying to create a sustainable society by transforming higher education. Our main program, our flagship program, is the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, which is a high visibility effort to address global climate disruption. And it's a, a big network of more than 680 colleges and universities who have committed to eliminating net greenhouse gases from all their operations and to embedding sustainability into all their research and educational efforts. So we have been working with AMS in a partnership to promote basic climate science education at all colleges and universities. We have been focusing on minority serving institutions through this partnership in order to, you know, develop a diverse student and faculty um, network of leaders uh, to increase opportunities at said institutions and to expand climate curriculum in vulnerable communities. Um, I'm going to let Jim talk more about the program and the benefits of it. But this is a very unique training opportunity. Um, for all you ACUPCC signatories out there, know that it fulfills the curriculum component of the ACUPCC Climate Action Plans. Um, and it is just a great way to introduce new courses related to sustainability and climate science to your institution. I will now let you all um, hear from James A. Bray from AMS, who will tell us more about this unique opportunity. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, it's good to be here today. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about AMS and about our diversity efforts um, that have been going on for a while and about how that is playing out um, in our partnership with Second Nature. Next. There are a lot of driving factors for why we are very interested in, in climate science and climate change and why we think everybody ought to be informed about it, uh, particularly those places that may not have considered having a climate course. The driving factors are in the news every day and I think there are things that we are all very concerned about. Um, the National Science Foundation underscores the needs for public literacy and what better way to introduce the public to this topic than by getting to the undergraduates. Next, please. Um, there are a lot of opportunities here. We want to protect prepare the next generation of earth scientists by promoting workforce development. We want to introduce role models who we have a lot of in the AMS membership. Um, and we want to provide insight into the excitement of earth science. And we want to encourage members of underrepresented groups to aspire to an earth science career because there are not a lot of members from underrepresented groups in the earth sciences. And this is an ideal way to give people a, a sense of what has the earth sciences have to offer in terms of a, a suitable field of study. How do you get a major, for example, if they don't have an introductory course? Next. 
AMS has been around almost 100 years. Our headquarters are in Boston. Um, our education program is based in Washington, D.C. We have a little bit over 14,000 members. We are known for our conferences and our journals, uh, perhaps best known for our consultants and broadcasters. You see the AMS Certified Broadcast Meteorologist seal um, on broadcasters' TV shows. In 1990, the AMS decided to get involved very significantly in teacher professional development, and um, we did so. We are also a nonprofit. Our mission is to promote the development and dissemination of information and education on the atmospheric and related oceanic and hydrologic sciences and the advancement of their professional applications in service to society. And perhaps the most important part of that mission is the sentence in service to society. Next, please. Our educational initiatives got started with our courses for teacher professional development. And the, those teacher courses involve a variety of data stream courses and summer workshops um, in our AMS disciplines. Teachers that get involved can earn free graduate credits and they get all their materials free. We also decided to spread um, some of that wealth out to undergraduate institutions because many places did not have a weather course, an ocean course, or a climate course. So we developed uh, sort of a parallel track of courses for undergraduates, which um, undergraduate institutions can then license and adopt um, as their, their materials. Next, please. The undergraduate courses are complete packages. In other words, people can adopt them and they have everything they need to mount a very successful course. Probably the most difficult thing for an instructor to do is to decide what of the materials present they want to use to uh, uh, establish their course goals. Um, we have a textbook, an investigations manual, which is kind of a lab manual, a real-time portal. A lot of this stuff is, is really kind of focused on real-time uh, excitement in the sciences. We, of course, have the usual materials for the faculty to support the faculty, including a good mentoring program. And our materials are useful in a variety of environments. We can also have, um, you know, the course mounted online or diversity projects can facilitate um, implementation at MSIs. And I'll say a bit more about that a little bit later. Next, please. Our changing climate is the climate course that's the basis for this partnership, and it's a comprehensive analysis of the Earth's climate system. Um, we touch upon just about everything, uh, including um, getting into some subjects like statistics and GIS, but also looking at how climate affects people and how certainly people have effect affected our climate. We even tackle head-on an analysis of climate change denial. So it's a very, very good climate course, very up-to-date, including um, AR5 of the IPCC, the third national climate assessment. Um, we're really up-to-date, probably the most uh, up-to-date materials out there. Next, please. This is uh, chapter 13, dealing with some of the human needs, actions, and public policy. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but we have really made an effort to dig deep into this human um, relationship with our climate and uh, how that works both ways. And um, we think that um, students will find this very, very exciting. And the students that have studied this um, uh, have found it exciting. We get very good reports back from those that have adopted. Next, please. Uh, but we also have the coursework, which is sort of the labs associated with this, and they are a very, very good um, opportunity for people to actually dig into the data, dig into the report, and actually do um, lab work um, on the, a particular topic. Um, labs, in this case, don't use test tubes or, or uh, uh, samples of things, but uh, actually raw data sets that students then, then can analyze. Next slide, please. And uh, these are, are just some of the maps and, and, and things from the various reports that we use. Next, please. Our diversity project started with our weather diversity project, um, and um, we've had 145 MSIs uh, involved with that, uh, thousands of students, and it was, uh, in fact, the first weather course 
for most of those institutions. We then followed that up with an ocean studies diversity project when we began an ocean course. And uh, again, that was a shorter running project, but it still uh, impacted uh, quite a number of, of MSIs. Next slide, please. Next. Our climate diversity, of course, uh, came along right at the time we introduced the climate course. And this may be um, our best program yet. It was well funded and um, we're moving forward to involve over 100 MSIs over five years. And we're in the final year of that program now and we're actively recruiting faculty to get involved with us. And um, you are certainly welcome to become involved with this great partnership. Um, we have um, faculty come to Washington, D.C. and see and hear from some of the best climate scientists. We have field trips to NASA, NOAA, and Howard University, and um, everybody has a really great time for that week. And then we bring the faculty members back for a follow-up at our AMS annual meeting. And in the case of this year, it's going to be in New Orleans, so that's going to be a good time ha had by all. Next, please. And just this is a view um, of uh, part of the group, um, one of the years in front of the Goddard Space Science Network. And um, uh, it, it is really a great uh, time. If you're interested, go to that website listed on the slide there, www.ametsoc.org, climate diversity, and we'll get you an order form, a uh, license order form and an application, and you can send it to us and move on. Next slide, please. Of course, we couldn't do this without the help of our friends. We um, uh, sort of want to give credit to NSF who funded this, uh, to um, NASA who funded the original climate program, who, for, for NOAA who is an active partner in the climate thing, and to our great partner Second Nature for moving this along. Next, please. And this is where I could be found if you have any questions or you would like to talk to someone about our workshop, uh, uh, send me an email and I'll get you on the phone and we'll, uh, we'll get you all set up. Thank you. Next, um, we have uh, Christina Reeves Schull from the Physics, and the Physics and Engineering Program Coordinator at Cedar Valley College. Thank you, Dr. James. Yes, I am uh, Christina Reeves Schull from Cedar Valley College and currently in the process of implementing the Climate Studies course and one of our slogans at our college is uh, basically, uh, as you can probably see it, is doing things right and doing the right things for the people, the planet and the economy. Next please. This is just uh, where I can be reached. There's my email address right here. And uh, I am uh, working in conjunction with Dr. Maria Bocalandro, which is our sustainability program director here on campus. We have a large focus of that, of uh, sustainability here. Next. So kind of the foundation of sustainability at Cedar Valley College is our Sustainability Communities uh, Institute and its basic goal is to have sustainable practices in action. And it's a, originally it is a virtual institute, but it covers several practices. And one of the ideas is to promote sustainability to the college, all the employees here and our students and our surrounding community. And as part of this, um, I applied for the AMS Climate Studies program and was able and was accepted and attended last May 2014. And I'm in the process of implementing the uh, Climate Studies course. Next, please. So if we look at our sustainable practices in action at Cedar Valley, since 2007, Cedar Valley has been a signature uh, of the ACU PCC uh, commitment. And uh, the uh, science building that I have the opportunity to work in is a LEED Goal certified building, 2012. And it's wonderful. It's got passive lighting, um, a lot of recycled material in the facility, controlled lighting. And as part of our sustainability practices also here is we sponsor for the uh, 
second annual meeting, we have a responsible pathway sustainability conference. Clean jobs, clean resources, clean environment, and quality of life. And the students in the uh, that are doing the climate studies will be presenting some of their results uh, at the conference. And that uh, starts March 20th here in Dallas. Next, please. Also part of our sustainability practice is the Living Lab. And the AMS course is definitely a part of that. Students experience hands-on opportunities. Uh, I am a physics and engineering coordinator, and I teach physics classes, astronomy classes, as well as geology classes. And my uh, physics classes are actually analyzing the kilowatt hour usage in all our buildings and finding some intriguing things and then starting to analyze and actually go to each building to see what the issues might be, why we have some buildings that are using so much energy. The uh, geology class uh, that I taught last fall, which is an introductory or science class, we focused on erosional issues on campus and uh, actually worked and developed a video pointing out some erosional issues we have which are actually quite close to the science building we have. We also have a green jobs and sustainable studies program, a residential building performance technology, and then we have continuing education programs for green jobs training. Plus, if you graduate here, uh, there are courses that are green certified. And if you take three green courses with a C or higher, then you can graduate with a green cord. And I'm in the process of getting myself certified for uh, several, to have several of my courses be green courses. Next. So how does the AMS Climate Studies course fit into all of this? It is being offered currently as part of our geology, an existing course we have in the Dallas Community College District, Geology 1402, Earth Sciences for Non-Majors. And the focus of that course is basically kind of a continuation of Geology 1401. So we go, we can go more in depth to any of the topics there. So we could actually focus on oceanography in the course, or we could focus on physical geology or astronomy. And they also, another focus we look at is they want to discuss natural hazards in those contexts. And climate also is a big emphasis if we're in that area. So how I am constructing it is the first eight weeks of our course is looking at natural hazards from the perspective of their effect on climate change or the opposite. How does climate change affect them? And what my students have done is really interesting. They analyzed all of the different um, areas of influence that are under the uh, the Earth system science approach, and we found that climate studies and climate change is the only natural hazard that interacts with all of the Earth's processes. So, for example, today in my course, after our seminar, my students are going to be presenting items from space that could, natural hazards that could affect Earth, as in particular with the emphasis on how it would affect our climate. For example, a supernova explosion. And then the second eight weeks of this course is going to be the AMS Climate Studies course implementation. And it will be part of our Living Lab program. And again, like I said, we will probably be presenting at least posters and maybe some um, data analysis at our uh, sustainability conference. Next, please. What we plan to do is, in the future here, is continue to offer this course as all are part of Geology 1402. And then, like I said, there are some related courses here. The 1401 or Sciences for Non-Majors 1 is the companion course. We also have a meteorology course that we're offering this spring for the first time, 1447. And we may pursue in the future uh, talking to Dr. James Bray at getting the AMS uh, meteorology course as part of that. And the three courses, the Geology 1401, the 1402, and the 1447 serve as the foundational course for the new geology program here 
at uh, Cedar Valley College. So if I were to uh, think about what else I would want to present here, I guess the biggest thing is the course easily fits into existing courses that you have. That's how I am using it here at Cedar Valley College as part of the Geology 1402. It could be another, it could be its own course standing on its own. A lot of people often wonder, you know, why is a physics and an astronomy person teaching this course? Basically, climate studies is a study in physics. It's about the flow of energy through an environment and it fits quite well across multiple disciplines and that's how you can have multiple disciplinary people teach it. A physicist could teach this, an environmental scientist could teach this, a geologist could teach it, and an astronomer could teach it because if you're going to be talking about Earth and the other planets then it does fit and particularly comparing climates from other worlds and what we've learned from them back to our Earth as well. It was, it was a neat opportunity to be able to do this because Cedar Valley College is a historical black college and having this opportunity now is going to allow us to really be able to build a geology program and for the uh, at least for the Texas State Colleges, you have to have eight semester, eight semester hour or credit hours of science in your uh, initial 42 college hours and geology courses count as part of that. And so to be able to offer climate studies to our students will help them be prepared. And I found enough resources and support from the AMS with this course that it has not been a problem to implement it. And the students enjoy the price and they're actually looking quite forward and are beginning to dig into the book and the lab opportunities. So I think i go ahead and do next for our next slide. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who helped provide us the opportunity, NOAA and NASA and uh, Second Nature and the AMS. And again, if you're interested, show Sustainable Practices in Action. Here's our website that talks about our Sustainable Communities Institute. And this is from our conference last year. And we had quite a very many attendees. We had several local farmers. It has become a a central conference for our community and being able to have our climate studies be a centerpiece of this will uh, be very important for the community and for our students. So what I would like to do next is present um, Dr. Paul Bartlett so he can take over from me. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I teach at uh, St. Peter's University. I'm a research fellow there. I also teach a course on air pollution at the University Center at Svalbard in the Arctic. Uh, the work that I do here uh, at St. Peter's is to implement sustainability in different various ways. So I work with Dr. Eileen Poyani, who's chair of the Sustainability Council and special assistant to the president. I also want to thank Nicholas Cariovalati from the Guarini Institute and Anna Brown from the Social Justice Program that also enthusiastically support climate studies. Next. Uh, so sustainability at St. Peter's started uh, when uh, our president, uh, James Loughran, uh, co-founded the New Jersey Higher Education Partnership for Sustainability. And this has been really important for us because we all learn from each other. It's a uh, Every, every college experience is different with sustainability. We have different barriers, different things blocking us, uh, and people are very supportive of each other in this organization. Uh, then our following president, our first lay president of a Jesuit school here at St. Peter's, Eugene Kronakia, uh, signed the um, climate commitment with uh, Second Nature. And Second Nature and ACU PCC has really helped guide 
more ad hoc efforts that came from below from different faculty of staff and here and there to start developing a plan, which I also worked on, um, a climate action plan, which was led by Virginia Bender from our institutional and strategic planning in the president's office with help from Second Nature. Uh, next. Uh, oh, uh, before that, yeah. Uh, with each school, it's important or it's helpful when you're it's not a generalized thing in sustainability and climate studies to appeal to the general mission of the college. In our case, um, we're a Jesuit school. I myself am not Catholic, uh, but I do like a lot of the Jesuit ideals and um, identity. And so our mission statement was changed to say, excel intellectually, lead ethically, serve compassionately, and promote justice in our ever-changing urban and global environment. Uh, our next step now is to integrate sustainability in the university strategic plan, which we are doing at this time, at the same time we're revising our climate action plan for second nature because we're at our five-year point. Uh, next. Uh, the first activities we really did uh, with the New Jersey partnership and with second nature is it helped us focus on the campus and going carbon neutral. And we've gone a long way with that. A lot of schools have, uh, we have cogeneration, which is actually a lot cheaper, makes us more resilient. The solar panels, 100% uh, wind that we purchased from Con Edison Solutions. And we also have uh, our first uh, lead building, which is our student center, which helps us uh, communicate with the students what we're up to. Uh, and also, after Hurricane Sandy hit us, and before that Irene, resilience is becoming uh, a local issue connected to climate change. And these activities make our campus more resilient. Fortunately, we're on the top of a hill, but we have a lot of coastal areas in Jersey City and Hoboken, which is at uh, sea level in our county. Next. Now, the hard part is sustainability curriculum. It's in the Climate Action Plan, but I don't think we've made as much progress as we wanted to. We did establish our environmental studies major um, through Dr. Pat Redden, uh, and she's the chair of the chemistry department, and she wanted to do this before she retire, establish this program. Uh, before that, there was um, some of the faculty, including myself, in started introducing sustainability in the curriculum, even though we weren't always necessarily supposed to, but um, it's important to inform your chair you're doing that, uh, which I did. Uh, but uh, all courses can have as some aspects of sustainability and climate change, but that's not yet formalized. Uh, we are trying to work on that uh, formalization. We don't have a green certification course like uh, Christina has at her school, but we're talking about now our first step is to reach out to instructors that we know are teaching sustainability and climate change and feature them and their courses on our sustainability page, web page at uh, um, St. Peter's. And we also want to use that as an opportunity to start laying the groundwork for uh, following the ASH stars. Though at this point, we just got through two two assessments and we can't even use the word assessment with our faculty now. But we're looking at the STARS as sustainability assessment as a guide to, uh, along with our climate action plan with Second Nature, to include climate studies and uh, sustainability in the curriculum and in other aspects like student life. Uh, what the AMS climate studies course is now um, being used as an optional curriculum for our uh, environmental studies intro, which is a common core science requirement, both undergrad and continuing ed. So I plan to teach that in that course um, shortly, uh, hopefully this summer. But we also want to have greater impact on approaching the School of Education, which even though I have great relationships with them, they have a very rigid program. So I'm trying to talk them into uh, allowing us to have a climate studies sustainability class in the School of Education because, of course, if we teach that in the master's program, then we reach a lot of teachers throughout uh, New Jersey. And we also plan more faculty development workshops, uh, which I went to one at ASH in Portland, 
where they taught you how to introduce sustainability in all kinds of courses. Uh, next. Uh, so I'm going into some of the challenges we have in getting these courses in. The first thing my academic dean said, if you want to introduce a new course, you have to take away another one. That's because we're in a financial crunch in the Northeast. We have a decline of births. We have decline in um, uh, the pool that's going to go to college up to uh, 2020, a uh, decrease of 15%, which is huge. And the... Uh, uh, the other aspect of the changing demographic is an increase of immigrants from uh, Latinos and minorities that will reach close to 50% uh, nationally. Now, we're a minority-serving institution, a Hispanic, uh, sorry, Hispanic-serving institution. We're the fourth most diverse comprehensive university in the North, uh, according to U.S. News and World Report, and we're the most diverse Jesuit school in the country. So that's actually an advantage. We know how to work with uh, different types of students with different backgrounds and different interests. And we do have to st stimulate the interest in climate studies and sustainability to get them to take the course and the major in the first place. And one lesson on the major is I think we should have made it a minor. And the other lesson is we had a business track in it and we need to put that back in. That was taken out at the level of the provost and board of trustees, but we have a huge amount of business students. And it's the business students that are going to make a lot of the decisions that will affect climate change, uh, mitigation, and adaptation. Uh, next. One of the aspects of uh, including sustainability across a career curriculum and get climate change studies and develop a demand for this is to, to work with sustainability. It's not just enough to just have the knowledge and the cognitive skills. We're finding that isn't enough for people to act. Um, they also need interpersonal skills in order to be able to persuade people to work effectively in organizations. Wherever you are when you introduce climate studies or sustainability, you're usually a minority and it's not always a welcome message. Uh, so you need to have some core values, you need to have good attitudes. Uh, we try to develop social norms um, to include things like sustainability and behavior. A long time ago the colleges were all geared to character development and I was at a workshop at Teachers College recently and they said a Carnegie report um, advised all the colleges and universities to emphasize cognitive skills, which they did, but they dropped character and all these other aspects. Uh, a way to introduce this into your college across the cur curriculum is we're all pushed now in assessment to have student learning objectives. So I want everyone to think about including sustainability student learning objectives in all the classes, um, student life, and all the different courses. Uh, next. Uh, developing awareness and support for action. There's different things we've done on campus, uh, student activities, uh, lectures and events, uh, community service. We have a, one of the best community service programs uh, and so that's a good place to build from. And uh, service learning. Uh, we're working with disaster resilience in the local neighborhood and we're planning some new activities to go with the climate studies course to look at air pollution and the co-benefits of reducing sources of climate change and air pollution on a local level. Uh, next. And this is one of the activities we do every fall now. Uh, our third fall, uh, we do a community garden celebration and we made sustainability a theme of this and I have to admit, being a member of the climate studies cohort had a lot to do with this. So every aspect of this had to do with uh, climate change. And we got the students to uh, build a puppet for the, um, the first big people's climate march in New York City, which is the next slide. And there you see the puppet they made um, and the students and the faculty in the background. And this is what is what we call collective efficacy for systemic change. Our overall goal is to have students have an experience where they're making change uh, working with other people. 
And I'd like to thank, of course, AMS and Second Nature for making this possible, and NOAA and NASA and NSF for funding this, and all the students, faculty, and staff at St. Peter's. And the tiny thing in the corner is the poster we did uh, for St. Peter's and the climate change course cohort for AMS in Phoenix. And that was a great experience. A lot of people came up, looked at it, had a lot of questions, connected with me with people from other religious colleges and how to work with that. So I want to thank you. And uh, I guess at this point, I turn it back to the uh, moderator, Gabriella. Um, thank you, Paul. Next. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to be entering the Q&A section of uh, our webinar. And again, I'll remind you that if you have any questions, you can submit them through the questions function in your panel. Um, I'm going to start this off with um, a, a question that I think is, is very general for everyone. And um, Christina and Paul, you've both kind of touched on this already, but if if you had to give um, faculty who are considering participating in this workshop one reason to attend, um, what reason would that be? Christina, can you go first and then Paul? I would say for me, the one of the biggest reasons would be access to the data in a, in a centralized and easy to use location because that's very important. The data is always out there, but sometimes it's hard to get to it. And AMS allows us the focused access. And my answer would be giving us, giving me the confidence to teach a climate studies course. I, th I thought I didn't know much about climate and found out that I did. And, but then it takes a lot to put together a new course and then persuade people on your uh, campus to uh, adopt that course. And this makes it easy. It's not only the ebook, which is very interactive, but like Christina said, the supporting materials are up there. They give you updates every week on uh, events and uh, new knowledge in climate science and weather. Thank you very much. Um, I have a related question. Um, so that's the, the main reason that you would um, give for faculty to attend. What was your biggest takeaway from the workshops or that aha moment um, that you experienced? during that workshop. Um, again, um, you can start with Christina and then Paul. I think my biggest aha moment was realizing, what was, I, I think one of the biggest ahas was when we went to Howard University and realizing and seeing that there were so many different um, disciplines involved in it. The one that really intrigued me was the one about uh, social policy and working with uh, underrepresented group uh, communities and doing research on how they respond to uh, natural hazards, how they respond to storms or things that kind of threaten their well-being that's coming from a natural uh, threat. My, my aha moment is, I guess, Howard University too, but NASA, NOAA, when I saw how much the sci climate scientists enjoyed what they were doing, mm. and uh, and also to see how they actually did their work, uh, how they made their forecasts given the large uh, mainframe computer supercomputer results that they got, how they worked that with other points of information, and did rapid response, and but still the enjoyment all around people, and I, I noticed that at AMS conference, uh, the, the people that really like their work. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to, um, to Jim. Jim, we have a question here about what constitutes basic climate science and um, what the difference is between climate science and climate studies, um, given that the name of the workshop is climate studies. Well, I think climate science uh, generally focuses uh, quite tightly on the physics aspects of, of radi radiational balance and, and what happens as these energy pathways are, are, are moved through. Um, climate studies, I think, brings in the human element, and, and that's a big difference. Um, it makes it more relevant for students. I think it makes it more relevant and enjoyable to teach as a faculty person. and um, 
basically once you understand the science then it's a very natural segue into seeing how we as human beings that are very impactual on the earth um, have had a big hand in, in changing our climate and then also how the climate can very very demonstrably affect us and not just in the future but in the present. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned making the climate studies more relatable for students. Um, we got a couple of questions uh, regarding getting students interested in climate science. Um, I would like to ask all three of you to, if you have any advice for how to make this, um, this topic uh, more relatable, more interesting, and um, just getting students interested in the climate science. Um, Jim, we can start with you and then Paul and Christina. Well, I think that students are intrinsically interested in this topic. They may have different views about it, but they're interested. And um, uh, from what I've heard from our adopting faculty, they don't have any trouble engaging the students given the materials that the students are working with. The students also particularly like the fact that it is up to date and they're dealing with, with things that are in the news this day. Uh, we actually create some of the activities every week in our office that are then posted on the website for students to work on. So it is a, a very um, a dynamic and very, very current um, study, and the students really do respond to that. Thank you. Um, what about you, Paul? Do you have any advice? Well, one thing I noticed that surprised me is there's an article in the New York Times on February 9th where there was a new poll that showed that Hispanics are much more concerned about global warming than uh, Anglo whites. Uh, so there's an in, they're concerned about how it's going to affect them personally, and they really believe that the government should do something about it. So even though it may, in our case, uh, most of our Latino students in social justice are really most interested in um, undocumented workers, immigration, and things that are that has a priority for them and their ability to go to graduate school and stay in this country, but. Um, when, when a lot of the students, when you they get involved and learn about the disasters in other countries and other places, realize that a lot of the displacement and the migration, uh, some of it's political, but a lot of it's natural disaster. Um, and I think there's many different ways of doing it. That's why we do these outdoor activities that are general. It's always good to have food and music and things like that. So we're doing these things to generate interest. When I taught a class and had um, had them rate what they wanted to do for special topics and had sustainability and climate studies. You would usually be rated really low in preference, but once I gave them an introduction to it, it would bounce up there to be in the top two or three. So I think we have to work with them to develop the interest. I agree with Paul on that, and that is why um, we're going to have the uh, students who are taking the course this semester present at our sustainability conference as well as do some extensive activities for Earth Day celebrations here. The biggest thing is the visibility and it's nice that at Cedar Valley and for the Dallas district we're able to offer this as part or all of a course that already exists and students says I've I kind of started with a word of mouth in my astronomy classes and said you know if you need another science to take after astronomy if you want four more credit hours you can take geology 1402 and it will transfer along with your astronomy as your eight credit hours of core and uh, there was some interest in that and I at least had one student who was like I want to take this course and then I've as I, and I also have some of the students from my Geology 1401 that took it. So again, I think with our uh, sustainability conference on Earth Day, that just getting the information out and having the students who are taking it now visible will uh, generate interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jim, I have a question here about um, eligibility for this program. Does it matter at all whether the course is going to be taught at the master's versus the bachelor's level and whether um, it is aimed at you know, science uh, degree earning students or education? Um, 
for eligibility for the workshop, um, a faculty person simply needs to teach at a minority serving institution, either an HBCU, a Latino serving institution, or a tribal college, or any institution that has great uh, that has 25% uh, or greater um, uh, minority enrollment uh, of students. So those are the the basic eligibility requirements. There's no uh, requirement that they be well versed in climate science or that sort of thing. Uh, Christina gave a good example of of how just about anybody could succeed with this course, um, tailoring it to their particular uh, expertise. Um, I think that um, you know a lot of people over the years have had experience with this, and and um, of course we have long experience with offering these courses for adoption uh, and introducing them to people that are teaching outside of their native discipline um, and um, so we bring that experience to bear from our weather course and our ocean course uh, now to the climate course and the actual workshop really uh, provides a lot of tips and pointers on how to be successful at teaching this course and of course we're just a phone call away um, the people on the staff here are not only competent scientists but many of us have taught these courses in our own home institutions before we came to AMS and Great. let me add, add something is the cohort model they have is we do this all as one group and then we meet again uh, at the conference and that has resulted in us helping each other. Um, so you have a broad group of peers to help you and most people are teaching out of discipline uh, in this. And also we've developed some collaborations of research and developing research uh, teaching materials. I don't think anybody really mentioned this, but it actually is free. So there is no cost you know, to the school or to the participant. Uh, all of the travel and the hotels and flights and food and everything is taken care of for both the workshop in D.C. and then the follow-up at our annual meeting. I, I know. My uh, administration was like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it is free. So that, that was... Uh, was uh, at least a huge selling point for our administration. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the reminder, Jim, about um, this great opportunity being at no cost. Uh, that's a very good thing to remember. It's, it's almost too good to be true. Um, but it is true, and that's fantastic. Um, I have a, it sounded like um, from what you guys were saying that it doesn't even matter or is not required for you to be a science faculty member in order to give this course because of not only the extensive preparation you will receive, but the support networks. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I, I think we take people from where they're coming um, in terms of their discipline and we point to the portions of the course that are most relevant um, uh, in our view to what they're doing. Um, we have had a wide variety of faculty members from a wide variety of disciplines being involved. Most are science and engineering professors, but um, more and more people are entering sort of with, with human interests. Human geographers, for example, have been very interested in the course. What about uh, non-faculty members, for example, sustainability staff on, um, on a campus? Would they be able to be a part of this workshop? Um, if they were able, one way or another, to introduce the course, we want to make sure that the person that does the workshop is being prepped for actual, actually offering the course and getting involved in terms of, of, of sustainability measures at their institution. And I think those two things go together. And if you're taking the workshop but you're not actually um, going to be offering the course, there's something lacking there because a good deal of the workshop itself is devoted to prepping people for the course offering. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, I have a question for Paul here, um, and you, you spoke a bit about this already when you were presenting, um, but do you have any more advice from your experience on how to convince your college deans or faculty um, to offer a course like this one at your institution? Well, we have support at my school on the president's side, and I did have support from the academic dean until she resigned, and so we have a new academic dean 
interim and an interim provost. So that has made things difficult. So what I've done is I've developed a broad alliance. In our case, we had the Sustainability Council and before that a green team. So I kind of knew the faculty that were interested in this. So I needed to really circle to be this broader than just one department and um, develop support in other places. It's, it's So it is a little delicate and and the other thing we did, just like Christina, we brought it into an existing course, but we got that existing course with help with Second Nature originally, so with the Climate Action Plan. Uh, so it is hard. The other thing is to just introduce it in pieces. That's what I did as soon as I started teaching here, is um, you can bring in climate studies into quite a few different types of courses that are existing. Yeah, I think in our experience, um, the two really good ways to get this established is to sort of have top-down support, and the ACU PCC is the best thing for that. Um, if your president signs the commitment, they usually find ways to um, work with the faculty and, and uh, curriculum committees and that sort of thing to get the, the course introduced. The other way is to have faculty champions and, and more importantly students that are clamoring for a good climate course. And of course if, if the students are asking for it and, and they're very active in sustainability efforts on the campus, that's another clear path to getting the course established. Thank you so much. Um, I would add to that as well, and thank you for, for mentioning the ACU PCC. If your institution is a signatory of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, um, and you are a faculty member, you are not the main sustainability point person for that commitment, it's a great idea to talk to them if you're interested in this course, because there is, is a win-win. You know, it, it helps institutions that are signatories of the ACU PCC to further their commitment and to um, and to comply with um, different requirements that are required by that by that commitment so it's a good thing for them to know that this is uh, something that's going to further the commitment and you can get more support through that um, through that space as well so um, another question that I have here is um, about the impact of the program so far, what has been the impact um, and how has AMS been assessing that um, success and impact? Well, I think our basic um, uh, measure of impact is the activism that this generates among the faculty that adopt the course. Um, they all come to that follow-up at our annual meeting and present posters and that is a very, very exciting experience because we see how um, our efforts and the efforts of Second Nature are really working on the ground, um, not only to get a course introduced, but to um, explore broader avenues towards sustainability on a particular campus and very often in a particular community. And that, I think, is, is sort of the proof of the pudding. Um, we also, uh, of course, uh, survey our faculty from time to time and interact with them in other ways. We get successful faculty members to mentor uh, new faculty members engaging in the course and of course we look at our overall adoption rates. This course is not just for for signatories or it's not just for for people that are uh, from minority serving campuses. This is available to any campus that would like to uh, adopt it and um, the cost of adoption is very inexpensive and the cost cost of the materials are, are uh, certainly um, not overly priced. Um, we also have our weather and our ocean courses available that uh, provide the seeds for um, developing a budding earth science department. So there are, there are lots of advantages and lots of opportunities and we've seen some of these things expanding and have been very, very pleased. Um, and I, I guess that's why we think we have a very successful program here. Thank you very much. Um, do you, either of you have any advice on how how to further integrate this course into larger sustainability action or projects on campus and how other aspects of the campus, uh, for example, operations can support the work being done through this through this uh, course? Well, I would say that conversation with your sustainability coordinator um, 
you know that champion is very very important but um, again um, most of the initiative I think is going to be from your students and I think your students if, if they're typical will respond to their instruction in um, in climate and and climate change studies and and um, in the human aspects that you may wish to uh, emphasize and they will uh, find personal reasons to get involved on campus and and getting students to be active in this area is the best way to spread it beyond into other aspects of your university or college and also into your community. Thank you. Paul, is there anything you would like to add to that? Um, could you remind me of the question was? Um, this is something that you already spoke to in your presentation as well, but um, how to further integrate oh, this course yeah. and how operations can support or any other, you know, sustainability yeah. departments. Yeah, what I would recommend if you, you have a green team or sustainability council to work with them. Uh, we had somebody in resident life we were working with, but then she got poached by another university. She was doing really good stuff. Um, so it's a constant thing I think to work with operations and one thing is I noticed that ASH has uh, um, in their in their um, ranking and assessment thing for each operation of a university it has kind of a scoring system so I, I'm going to use that to talk to the operations people to say look um, here's some th here's some guides and some things that you could do for your uh, for residents life and then actually we plan to keep track of that so we're actually in process of doing kind of a quiet self-assessment so it will be ready to do a full-blown one um, but as far as the courses itself goes with operations we haven't really done that yet um, but I, I like I had thought of the idea that we should I like this course so much that we should offer it to faculty and staff um, the course itself is kind of, we do work, faculty development workshops, but they're just an hour long. But it seems like this could be a basis of doing kind of an intensive uh, class for uh, faculty and staff, this curriculum. That's a great idea. Um, thank you. We are coming up on our end time here. So I would like to thank everybody who has uh, joined us for this webinar today. I would like to thank all of our panelists. Jim, Paul, Christina, I would like to thank AMS um, and the partnership that they have been having with us at, here at Second Nature and these great opportunities that they're offering um, for signatories and non-signatories. Again, this is a free opportunity. Please take advantage of it. Um, following this webinar, we will be sending an email with links to the recording so you can watch it again if you want to or share it um, and with links to the slides so you can download them and with uh, links to more information and reminders about how to apply for this opportunity and eligibility requirements. Um, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Gabriella.